Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 8 of Jube's 2011 Audiobooks and Music. With me, Mana Weezar, a.k.a. Jube's 2011, reading Fear by Liza Scotland. Thank you very much for coming back and listening. Fear by Liza Scotland, Chapter 11 Mary tried not to be nervous while her OBGYN, Dr. Melissa Foster, examined her from somewhere behind the white tank covering her knees. Mary had texted Anthony that he was on the way to the doctor's office, but Judy was with Mary now. Holding her hand, Mary realized that a best friend was somebody who would hold your hand when you're in stirrups. Mary glanced at Judy, who looked down at her with a reassuring smile. Standing next to the examining table, she managed to exit the meeting gracefully, leaving behind a concerned Benny and Judy, and had hailed them both a cab and gotten them here in no time. Mary had gone to the bathroom and discovered that she was spotting, so she called the doctor and had been told to come right in. Dr. Foster wasn't saying anything, and Mary fought the impulse to start chatting away the way she always did. She abhorred silence the way nature abhorred a vacuum and always found herself yapping at times that normal people stayed quiet. Like when she was getting her hair cut, her nails done, or even during a a massage. She had a pedicure once and talked non-stop at the pedicurist who spoke only Korean as it turned out. Mary was no different at the OBGYN's office, and she delivered some of her best lines when she, best lines when there was a speculum inside her, but not this time. Dr. Foster, Is everything okay? Mary asked, unable to quiet another minute. Give me another minute or two, Dr. Foster answered, which Mary knew was code for, please stop asking questions. Mary's gaze fell on Dr. Foster's framed diplomas with their fancy gold seals and that gave her some reassurance. Dr. Foster was one of the best OBGYNs in the city, and Mary had been lucky to get into her practice. The doctor was in her early 50s with an academic bent since she taught at medical school. She was African-American, and she wore her hair short, and her features were fine bound behind her glasses with her, with their heavy black frames. Little diamonds twinkled from her earlobes, and her frame was petite, but super fit since she was a runner. Mary loved her kind but no nonsense bedside. Mary loved her kind but no nonsense bedside manner. 
Dr. Foster was who you wanted if your pregnancy was in trouble, which Mary prayed wasn't the case. She glanced around the room trying to draw reassurance from the soft mint green of the walls. The colorful watercolor bouquet in a pale blue frame and the flowery pink letters of the requisite inspirational saying sign. I set my worries aside and let my body do its job. Mary looked away because the sign wasn't helping. It only reminded her of her job, which was back at work, trying not to lose everything she and Anthony owned. She was still reeling from John's quitting and terrified that it would pull a nail and put a nail in the coffin of the lawsuit. Benny had even called it a death blow, which wasn't the kind of panicky language she used. Mary had known that being sued was stressful, but she had never realized how completely stressful it could be until it happened to her. Suddenly, there was a soft knock at the door, and Mary looked to the left to see Anthony enter the room worriedly. Hey, hubby, how are you? The question is, how are you? Anthony came over, kissed Mary on the forehead, and took her other hand, glancing at Judy and Dr. Foster. Judy, thanks for bringing her. Hi, Dr. Foster. No worries, Judy answered. Anthony, hi. Dr. Foster said from behind the tent, which was the opposite side of the room from the door. Mary realized the setup of the room was intentional because nobody wanted to open a door onto whatever was on the other side of the tent, of the white tent. The thought made her smile, but it went away. Okay. Dr. Foster got up from her rolling stool and smiled in a professional way, taking off her purple plastic gloves. I think everything's fine. Thank God, Judy blurted out, even before Mary and Anthony then realized she had talked out of turn. Sorry. It's okay, Mary said, touched. It's a relief. God knows. Anthony looked at Dr. Foster, his eyes wet with the emotion he was trying to hold back. But what was it then? Mary said she was spotting. And I don't know what exactly... And I don't know what exactly does that mean. Spotting means there was some blood and perfectly nor... And spotting means that there was some blood. And that's perfectly normal from time to time. Especially in the first trimester. Mary interrupted. But I'm in my third trimester. Yes, I know, Dr. Foster answered patiently. But I've examined you, and I'm not overly concerned. It does happen, and you need to come in and have me check it out when it does. But what causes it? It's symptomatic of some conditions that luckily you don't have. Like what? Well, like placental abruption, which is caused when the placenta is detaching from the uterine wall, or even or even preterm labor, but you are not in labor. 
You said you weren't feeling any contractions and you had no more nausea than usual. Right. And I haven't had any dizziness or anything like that either. Got it. Dr. Foster cocked her head. Are you under stress, Mary? Mary blinked, and Judy burst into laughter. Anthony didn't. Mary answered. Let's just say things are busy at work. Dr. Foster smiled more warmly. I know, I hear you. Doctors always tell you to eliminate stress, and that's completely impossible in the modern world. You're a lawyer, and stress is part and, par and parcel of your profession. That's exactly right, Mary said without elaborating. She didn't want to whine about being sued and... She knew that Dr. Foster had a full waiting room, having squeezed her in on an emergency basis. So what do I do about the spotting? Nothing. Just try to take it easier. Here, scoot down for me. Dr. Foster began closing up the stirrups and placing Mary's legs down under the sheet. Can I go back to work? Yes, but no strenuous activity like racquetball. Good, I don't play racquetball. I do. It's going to be the death of me. Dr. Foster smiled. Any other questions? Anthony looked over, frowning. Dr. Foster, she was at work today. Should she go home? She should go home, right? Maybe, just to relax, though it's not medically necessary. Anthony shot Mary, uh, I knew it. But doctor, when you say take it easier, what do you mean? Should she cut down on her hours at work or work part-time? Judy squeezed Mary's hand. Mayor, if you have to, you could take it easier at work. Like, take it down to three days a week. I'll watch your desk, pick up the slack. Or you can work from home. Dr. Foster shook her head. There's no me medical reason for Mary to do that unless she wants to. The doctor turned to Mary. Do you want to? No, Mary answered, avoiding Anthony's eyes. But on the other hand, I would never do anything that hurts the baby. Of course not. I wouldn't advise you to go back to work if I thought <clears throat> it would compromise the pregnancy or the baby. Dr. Foster put her hand on the doorknob. But you're perfectly healthy. Proceeding along right on track. Today was a blip on the screen, but that's it. Feel free to call if you have any other questions, and of course if you have any further spotting, okay? <clears throat> okay, Mary smiled, almost reassured. Thanks so much, Dr. Foster. Dr. Foster thinks, Anthony said, and Judy waved goodbye. Thanks from me, the aunt-to-be, Dr. Foster smiled. See you at your next appointment, Mary. Just put your gown in the basket and leave when you're ready. Take care, she left the examining room, closing the door behind her. Okay, Mary said, heaving a heavy sigh, and Anthony bent over and gave her a kiss on the forehead. That was scary. I bet Mary felt a wave of love for him and concern. 
I didn't mean to freak you out when I called. Not at all. I'm glad you told me. You didn't tell my parents, did you? Are you nuts? Anthony smiled crookedly. Okay, I won't go back to work. I'll go home with you. Yes, the car's in the... in a lot. You check out and I'll come pick you up. No, Anthony, I can go without you. Judy touched Mary's arm. Mare, Anthony's right. Let him get the car. You get dressed and we'll meet... And we'll meet him. Thanks for the assist. Anthony shot Mary a look. Hear that, honey? Listen to reason. Or, fa or failing that, listen to me. Judy grinned. Huh. Anthony walked around the examining table, giving Judy a quick kiss on the cheek. Thanks for taking her, Judy. You're the best aunt to be. I so am, Judy grinned, and Anthony left the room, choosing the door behind him. I mean, closing the door behind him. Mary heaved another sigh. I guess I should go home. You really should. I hate leaving you and Benny in, in the lurch. You're not, Judy waved her off. We have more than enough lawyers on the case. If anything, we have way too many. <clears throat> But we have work to do on London Technologies with John gone. We're not going to get it done today, and I already have a plan. The case is in the discovery phase now, so I'll team up with Anne, read the file, and review Intera... In Intera... Gatorys and documents. I'll get up to speed and she and I will take the depositions. But that's so much. What do I do? I want to help. You can by defending the deposition. That will be easier. You don't even have to know the file. That's too easy, Mary said, feeling a wave of guilt. Defending the defending depositions was much easier than taking them. Since the objections were the same in every deposition, regardless of the subject matter of the case, the gist was to make sure the client didn't Volunteer information or say something stupid. No, it's fine. Plus, you're defending the dep. The witness will have to come to us, so you don't have to travel. All you have to do is sit on your butt in the conference room. It's a perfect division of labor. Mary knew it made sense, even though it was the lighter load. She had a baby, and she was thinking for two. Okay, Anne. Okay, Anne said there was a debt to defend on Monday. I can do that. It may be too soon for you. No, I'm fine. We'll meet with Anne, and she'll get us up to speed on the big picture. Meanwhile, I'll email her and get any passwords to the file so I can read it at home today. I'm not that busy. I was already cutting back because of the... 
because of the baby. Okay, now let me help you off the table. Judy took Mary's arm, and Mary slid off the white sheet to reveal her hospital gown, which was open in the back. Don't look at my butt. I've seen your butt. Not lately. My stretch marks look like a bear attack. <laughs> Hush, you need help getting dressed. No thanks. Mary smiled, touched again by her friend's thoughtfulness. Judy may have looked wacky to the outside world with her magenta hair and fashion challenged outfits, but she was the one. But she was one of the most reliable and level headed people Mary had ever known. Okay, I'll meet you in the waiting room. Judy let herself out of the examining room, and Mary padded into the adjacent bathroom, where she dressed, avoiding the mirror, her enemy for the past seven months. Whoever said pregnant people glowed needed glasses. Pregnant people sweated, even in March. She picked up her purse and left the examining room. Trundling down the hallway and taking a left toward the billing and reception area. When she heard a hubbub coming from the reception area. She went through the glass door only to be greeted by the reception room full of bewildered patients, a nervous Judy, and most of South Philly in the form of Mary's mother, father, Elvira's, and the Tonys were surged forward as a vaguely hysterical group when they spotted Mary. Pop? Mom? Mary recoiled, horrified. How did you know I was here? Honey, you alright? Anthony told his neighbor he was going to meet you at the doctor. And she called Kamar Millie, who knows Cousin Tootie with the eyes, so he Fear by Liza Scotland Read by Mano Weezar aka Jubes 2011 Chapter 12 Day turned to night at home and Mary sat in her favorite chair by the window which was called a chair and a half since it was wider than normal. <clears throat> she and Anthony used to cuddle in it on Saturday nights and watch Netflix together, but now that she was pregnant, she needed the entire chair to herself. On her left was a box of saltines and on her right was a bag of popcorn, as if she had traded in her husband for, kybo, for carbohydrates. She had her feet up on the ottoman and her laptop open on her lap, though she had to type around her though she had to type around her belly and her navel kept hitting the space bar. She found her gaze wandering outside the window, watching her neighbors giving their dogs at a last walk or coming home from restaurants or the movies. Her and Anthony's townhouse was in the written house section of the city.
a three-story brick colonial that was nevertheless a row home. Although in a higher rent district than South Philly, it had been their neighbors two doors down. The McIlly the McIll Hennies. Who had spilled the beans about Mary's emergency visit to Dr. Foster, and it had taken many hours to persuade her parents that she and the baby were fine, so that they'd finally gone home. She glanced at her laptop, trying to focus. She was supposed to be reading the London Technologies pleadings. But, antitrust was one of the most technical, business-oriented business areas of the law. She felt distracted by her worries about the baby, the lawsuit against her and the others, and John's departure. She hated that everything was exploding right now. Even when she should have been easing into the baby's arrival. She planned her caseload so carefully. Scaling back the active files and not taking any new clients, but that had gone by the wayside. Life wasn't going well if contractions would be a relief. Life wasn't going well if contractions would be a relief. Mary kept her eyes on the laptop screen and her worries to herself, especially about the pregnancy, because she didn't want to get Anthony started all over again. He had lectured her at lunch and again at dinner about trying to take it easy at work. He sat on the couch on his laptop working on his book and ignoring the television which was playing the new season of The Crown, their latest binge watch. She didn't know when Netflix had become the background music to their marriage, but there were worse things. Anthony stretched, checking his watch. It's getting late, almost eleven. You wanna you wanna go up? Sure, Mary said, though she hadn't gotten much done. Good. Anthony set the laptop aside, rose and brushed down his jeans, flashing her a weary smile. Can I get you anything? How about a kiss? Anthony smiled, came over, kissed her on the cheek, placing his hands on the soft arms of her chair. How do you feel? Fine, Mary answered, meaning it. Absolutely normal for a pregnant person. Tired? A little. Crampy? Nah. Bloated? Very. Mary smiled, touched. Anthony was learning girl lingo, but he spoke it like a second language. Which made sense. 
She had never been so aware of the differences between men and women before. Maybe it was because of the pregnancy or the lawsuit. Oddly, it felt like there was, like there were two separate sides. The way John had said, and she wondered if that notion was true. Or, t or testosterone induced. Mary didn't know as testosterone was the only hormone she lacked. Anthony smiled down at her, his gaze soft. You're preoccupied. I was, but it went away, Mary smiled, and Anthony kissed her again. This time on the lips, slowly. She felt a distinct tingle, and when he pulled away, she told him so. You felt a tingle? Anthony frowned. You mean a cramp? Mary smiled. No. A tingle comes from somewhere different. Anthony smiled back. Somewhere off base? Exactly, the forbidden zone. Or the promised land, Anthony laughed, and so did Mary. We shouldn't have sex, but I at least want to. It's the thought that counts, Anthony smiled. We forget to, we forgot to ask Dr. Foster when we could. Because we know the answer, like in 2082, Anthony smiled. When the kid leaves for college? When the last kid leaves for college, Mary shot back as her cell phone started ringing. Saved by the bell, Anthony chuckled. Or interrupted. Mary checked the screen, and it was Benny calling. So she answered, Benny. Denuncio, did you hear? Benny's tone sounded urgent, and Mary knew something was very wrong. Hear what? What's the matter? John's dead. He's been murdered. Get your motor running, head out on the highway, looking for adventure, and whatever comes our way, yeah, darling, go make it happen, take the world in a love embrace, fire all the guns at once and Explode into space. I like smoking lightning. Heavy metal thunder. Racing with the wind. And the feeling that I'm under. Yeah, darling, go make it happen. Take the world in a love embrace. Fire all the guns at once and explode into space. Like a true nature's child, we were born, born to be wild. We can climb so high, I never want to die.
the guns at once and explode into space like a true nature's child. We were born, born to be wild. We can climb so high, I never want to die. Born to be a wild. Born to be a wild. Baby, kiss me. Fill my heart with song. Let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship. In other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. Fill my heart with song, let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, Please be true, in other words, in other words, I love you. <laughs> Night and Whether near to me or far, it's no matter, darling, where you are, I think of you. Day and night, night and day. Why is it so that this longing for you follows wherever I go? In the roaring traffic's boom, in the silence of my lonely room. I think of you day and night, night and day, under the hide of me, there's an oh, such a hungry yearning. Burning inside of me, and its torment won't be through till you let me 
Spend my life making love to you Day and night Night and day Night and day You Beneath the moon and under the sun Whether near to me or far It's no matter, baby, where you are I think of you Day and night, night and day, why is it so that this longing for you follows wherever I go? Traffic's boom in the silence of my lonely room. I think of you day and night, night and day. Under the height of me, there's an oh, such a hungry burning inside of me, and its torment won't be through till you let me spend my life. Making love to you Day and night Night and day I am going to sing so do my best.
I've got you under my skin. I've got you deep in the heart of me. So deep in my heart that you're really a part of me. I've got you under my skin. I tried so not to give in. I said to myself, this affair will never go so well. But why should I try to resist when, baby, I know so well. I've got you under my skin. I'd sacrifice anything, come what might. For the sake of having you near, in spite of the warning voice that comes in the night and repeats and repeats in my ear. Don't you know, little boy, you never can win. Use your mentality. Wake up to But it's time that I do take the thought of you. Make me stop just before I begin. Cause I've got you under my skin. But it's
time my tree just pushed out of view. Makes me think those people won't be gone. my skin here I am man always are singing you're in my I mean singing so close by John McLaughlin <laughs> you're mm-hmm. in my arms when all the world is calm the music Playing on for only two, so close together, and when I'm with you, so close to feeling alive. by romantic dreams must die so I bid my goodbye and never knew so close was waiting waiting here with you and now Forever I know that all that I wanted to hold you so close, so close to reaching that famous happy ending almost believing this one's not pretend and now you're beside me and look how far we've come so we are so close oh how could I face the faceless day if I lose you now, we're so close to reaching that famous happy ending, almost believing. This one's not pretend, let's go, I'm dreaming, for no, for we know who we are, so close, so close. Oh.